नमस्कार चैतन्य जी वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन नमस्ते राजनी प्लेजर टू जी जी प्लेजर टू हैव यू ऑन दिस फॉरम तो चैतन्य जी मे बी विल बिगिन एट द बिगिनिंग दैट यू नो वेर यू बॉर्न एंड हाउ डिड यू कम इन टच विद द लेगेसी ऑफ श्री नारायण गुरु when and where Man, were you born i was born 70 years ago in kerala at the foothills of the western ghats where three rivers meet so we have a, a southern triveni sangamam actually there are three rivers that meet in this town and my childhood it was all forested we had wild animals so that would stray into the garden and all that but now it's all gone it's no no forest left and there are rubber plantations or uh, other acacia plantations etc but because i have just been to kerala for two weeks in, after a long break and uh, i felt very sad actually that the, there is no village left it is all built up and i was at my birth place after a gap of 30 years what is the name of that town प्राइमरी स्कूल हाई स्कूल बिट अवे एंड देन Uh, college also away i was in hostels and then uh, as a student i was doing my final year ba in english literature when i met nagraj guru who was the disciple and successor of narayana guru that's right direct so, disciple that's right yes yes ji so and, i studied with him um, but can you say a bit about that meeting what was this first meeting like and and you know what drew you to his teachings well i must say it was his um, my first sight of him was he had cracked some joke <laughs> and uh, everybody including himself who well, laughed so this was my first uh, sight of the guru and uh, and then there was some kind of radiant kindness uh, i would now say it was should be called something more than that because and it uh, it was certainly also magnetic mm. and to me the whole trip was mm, very it still to me mysterious because i was uh, requested by a friend who is visually handicapped he wanted to go see this guru i did not realize that guru still lived i thought this all happened in some far gone past and and even though they would use the uh, title guru for school master to receive it but they were also beating up or disciplining us constantly because they saw that as 
part of their role, I suppose. And the old thing of sparing the rod and spoiling the child and all that. So I was reluctant to go meet any guru. But then his friend said, well, I need an escort because this guru is on this island, which was also very significant because we had to leave the main land to go. So we made this crossing. I walked with my friend for some six or seven kilometers to the other end of the island. No uh, means of transport. We just had to walk. and So we walked and got there and met this guru. But then, also interestingly enough, this friend had called me this morning. And again, I was reminiscing how how significant and also symbolic mm. that because I was the I was really blind and he was not he was sighted he knew about Guru he knows he knew Guru's live he and knew where somehow, to find Natraj Guru yes and he took me, and then later on, uh, I was learning this uh, shloka which says, I was blinded by the cataract of ignorance. And uh, the Guru applied in the collarium of wisdom, opened my eyes, and adorations to that Guru. So. Yeah, partner. Beautiful. Beautiful. So what exactly did it mean for you when you became a disciple of Nataraj Guruji? Uh, did you take sannyas or were you a scholarly disciple? Uh, what was the nature of that, uh, that period of your life? Well, Guru was... Um teaching. He was a triple honored doctor of letters from Sorbonne University. So, as well as the disciple of Narayana Guru. So, his um, educational background was uh, something we could not uh, Imagine, because it was so wholesome, both Western and Eastern philosophical traditions uh, met in him very harmoniously. Mm -hmm. Like when he would talk about some words from the Gita or Narayana Guru's compositions, he would immediately quote some either Plato or Aristotle or Einstein or Max Planck and science and philosophy. And so this attracted me very much. And I was also in college doing my final year BA. And College teachers for the first time were on strike in Kerala. This was the first ever uh, organized college teachers strike in Kerala. This was in 1971. So all this coincided to make me available to and very fortunate to meet this guru because the college was closed. We were asked to go home and that's when this friend asked me to accompany him to the guru. So Chaitanya Ji, because many of our viewers who will be seeing this are not familiar with the life and legacy of Sri Narayana Guru, can you very briefly describe uh, 
what is the significance of Sri Narayana Guru's life, who he was, and how he came to this motto, which you have you have you have quoted it in your book many times: one caste, yes. one faith, one God in humanity. So, if you could just yes. briefly, you know, frame that context, please. Yes. yes. Well, first of all, Narayana Guru and uh, it is not because of lack of respect or anything that I do not use Sri or G to his name. Well, because um, to me, Guru is the highest title that um, we have in our languages. And Guru, and also it is something that I find integrates all of India. Wherever you go, the respect for Gurus as teachers of wisdom about open, dynamic living uh, as taught by gurus, that is what holds us as a country together. Not any particular religion or language, but this honoring, touching the feet of the guru. When we travel anywhere in India, you will still find grannies in villages telling their grandkids, touch the Guru's feet. And he has walked all the way from the south. So you take the dust off those feet which have traveled far and wide. So Guru belongs, Narayana Guru belongs to this tradition of perennial wisdom teachers. And like we could trace this, say, for example, in the Indian context from Vyasa and then Kalidasa, Shankara, and then Narayana, that kind of a because there were also uh, master poets who sang their visions. And uh, Guru, in a way, reclaims the Guruhood of the common man in modern days. His um, lifespan was from 1854 to 1928. He had, he was born in a simple peasant family. Uh, he had um, his father was a uh, teacher in the local, I mean, he ran a primary school where the alphabet and basic numbers, etc. were taught. Guru attended um, traditional uh, Gurukula type of schooling where he studied Sanskrit as well as um, astrology and allied those days uh, subjects as they were taught, Kavya, Alankara, and all that. And as well as the Darshanas, Nyaya, Sankhya, Vaisheshika, Yoga, Vedanta, etc. Then he also ran a um, Harshala school in his own village for some years. 
but his contemplative nature, which was very evident even from his childhood, uh, made him not uh, pursue this uh, uh, school teacher uh, vocation, but and then he wandered some long period when we have no knowledge of what he did. But apparently he traveled around South India, must be learned Tamil, which along with Sanskrit is one of the ancient sources of our wisdom literature. And then he meditated in mountain caves or uh, also on the seafront in southern part of India. Then local people, cowherds, discovered him in a cave and started uh, feeding him and attending to him and slowly he stepped out of this uh, cave life and came down to be among the people and uh, also said that he would teach them better ways of living and so he was fully engaged but always um, acting from his uh, still center of non-active or non-active wisdom because his... What does that mean, non-active wisdom? Please explain. Oh, that is like the yogic way of seeing action in inaction and ah. inaction in action. Okay. You know, at this point, I, I maybe I should ask you to uh, tell the story of uh, apparently how, as a child, he also applied a very scientific approach to, uh, you know, his understanding of the world around him and that he he was told not to touch people of a certain caste so he would secretly go and touch them and then touch a person who didn't yeah. want to be touched to see yeah. what would happen so you know where was this uh, this if this energy a little bit if you could say about this well what what i um, understood uh, with some indications from Nataraj, which also was that, like, we were wondering, how did Narayana Guru get all this? Like, he was not educated in the modern senses. We are, like, he didn't speak English. But uh, how did these thoughts, which are so universal and all comprehending come and uh, now Rajaguru says it's something lying in the soil itself oh. and that if you are transparent enough this can come out through you and and that that possibility and this is how I see his um, asserting his role, calling himself a guru also. I see this as um, somehow. Yeah. And this was very marked because even when he was in the, in his teacher's gurukula, there again, there were different um, seating arrangements according to the uh, caste hierarchies. So some would sit 
along with the teacher on the veranda. Some would step on, sit on the steps. Some would sit in the yard, but still be able to listen to the teacher and all that. Um, some, and also some sat on just coconut leaves put on the floor, some sat on woven mats, etc. And some sat on some kind of little stools or planks. So some of the students asked Guru to sit at some particular place below. He went and sat there, and then he asked, from where should we draw breath? Sorry, from where shall we? Draw breath. Uh -huh. <laughs> the teacher came to hear of this and told the other students to leave him alone because the teacher recognized something in this youth, which was extraordinary, I would say, because his question was so logical. Okay, you tell me now where to sit. Okay, now please tell me where shall I draw breath from? So. Yeah. Yeah. No. One of the, uh, I mean, I, I. it's no surprise then that, you know, Guru was an influence on Mahatma Gandhi. But, uh, you know, in the uh, introduction to your book, uh, A Cry in the Wilderness, uh, it says that the Guru epitomized the way to mount a successful nonviolent revolution which must be grounded in philosophical realizations that are not divorced from practical considerations. And I, now that you yeah. told this beautiful story, I can see what was the, you know, the source energy for this. But yeah. so could you, before we get into the, the metaphysical issue of nonviolence in, in gurus and worldview and in his experience and his wisdom, can you give us a brief summary of the Gandhi Guru uh, equation? I mean, what is the story there? Well, I mean, mainly on the issue of nonviolence. And uh, after all, untouchability was a uh, was a brutal form of non uh, of violence. So yes. in that sense, the untouchability, the opposition to untouchability is a very intrinsic part of this story. Uh, please go ahead. So there was a devotee of Guru. His name is Mr. T.K. Madhavan. Madhavan was a um, Congress activist and was um, attending Gandhiji's meetings. So Guru raised the question, to Madhavan about Gandhi's um, Gandhiji's demand for independence in India and how can Gandhi ask for this while Indians themselves oppress each other in the name of caste and it was at the Congress um, meeting in Kakkinada in Andhra Pradesh or somewhere, where this question was raised by T.K. Madhavan. And Congress um, accepted the removal of untouchability among one of its proclaimed aims of the Congress party. So Guru was um, the 
instrumental behind this because Madhavan raised this question because it was raised by the Guru. Uh, and uh, while this uh, temple entry, Vaikam temple entry, Satyagraha, where Gandhiji's followers uh, and Gandhiji himself came, as well as like E.V. Ramaswamy Naikar Periyar from uh, Tamil Nadu came. And Guru had an ashram in that place, Vaikam. And Guru's ashram was fully left to the disposal of the Satyagrahis. And Guru also asked his followers to work Khadar Khadi. So, uh, but I also must mention uh, is a difference that I see between these two great uh, men. One who could be called a um, Rajya Guru, for example, yeah. and um, another one who I would say a Jagat Guru in its real sense. Gandhiji insisted on uh, calling himself a Sanatani Hindu right till the end. Guru said he has left all caste and religious differences, that he did not belong to any caste or religion that existed at his time. And this was, um, this was um, significant, I find. I I noticed you have quoted Guru as saying, like the dawn altogether of 10,000 suns, wisdom's function comes, tearing the darkness of Maya that shrouds awareness. Yes. So I, from what I'm hearing you say is that this awareness uh, you know the 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 discovering or yeah. removing the shroud that uh, yeah. you know prevents us from being fully aware. Yeah. Um, that is the basis of Guru's vision of this one world. Yes. Yes. But how did he then grapple in the everyday life with the reality in India, which was often and so large scale, in, on such a large scale, you know, different. What can we well, learn from, from, I know, what can we learn from how he addressed that gap between the ideal and the reality through nonviolence? Well, one is that he uh, used the very tools which were used by the oppressors through millennia. He acquired that knowledge. He was a Sanskrit scholar, he was a Tamil scholar, and he did intense contemplative search. Mm -hmm withdrawing away from the madding crowd. And then he could come back out and suggest ways that they could improve themselves or better themselves. And so Guru, instead of feeling that he was a victim, he 
total through total non-violent means acquired those very tools and like this poem on caste. Uh, it's called a critique of caste. It's interestingly the first verse is in Sanskrit and the remaining five verses are in Malayalam, which was the local language. Because it is through Sanskrit that the idea of caste became so rigid and oppressive. So, but that the poetic justice involved in this, how and um, why, why did he compose this one verse alone in Sanskrit? So it was addressing the perpetrators of such um, practices in their own terms, in their own language. Whereas the rest of the poem is simple uh, and for the people to follow what he and his first verse in Sanskrit says man's humaneness or humanity marks out the human caste or humankind just as cowness proclaims the cow. That's the first part of the words. And the second part says, Brahminhood and such are not like this. Nobody understands this truth, how sad it says. This, and then he goes on in Malayalam to say, one caste, one yeah. faith, one God, etc. One caste, one faith, one God. Yes. Nadraju Guru also restates this in more uh, acceptable terms. He says one kind of one kind of one faith and of one goal. He substitutes goal for God. And he explained that to us as not wanting to exclude so-called atheists. Correct. Also, so, I think maybe because his focus may have been on self-realization. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, which sometimes is not the same for some people as the search for God. So maybe he was just yeah. making that very clear. So Chaitanya Ji, you are a scholar and a student of the wisdom traditions of India. You have in fact... Not only of, not only of India. Okay, okay, correct, yeah. correct. Like Milare uh, probably from Tibet. That's right, that's right. Uh, and in your book, you speak about wisdom as a great river flowing silently through time. So, from your own very wide-ranging study of the wisdom traditions, can you help to locate the dynamic between violence and non-violence today? What is this? First, because first, let's look at the dynamic between violence and non-violence. And then secondly, I will ask you what advice you have for those who want to walk the path of non-violence. But first, let's understand the dynamic. You mean, why are we violent? Is I mean, that... in the sense that, see, violence is a part of the natural world. It, uh, and, and so yes. is... And so is non-violence. 
Yes. And as uh, perhaps we like to think the most sophisticated of sentient beings, we have a very long history of struggling with this dynamic between both these yes. tendencies in the yes. human being. Yes. So today, in today's world, what do you see as the advantages or some of the uh, both what is what is increasing non uh, what is increasing violence and also what has increased the potentialities for non violence because both things are somewhat uh, almost equally true yes yes well i see that uh, lot of um, violence it's not recognized as violence and it's um, expressing uh, frustrations of various kinds within the person and and um, also ways to express ourselves to, there's some construction going on nearby or reconstruction so people have no way to express um, like earlier we would India being, we were farmers mostly earlier. People had a lot of direct contact with the soil. Uh, they would dig or plow or plant. These kind of um, expressions. Oh, then the young people try to do it through listening to music, dancing, etc., but also gets vitiated with various um, substance abuse and all that uh, happens, especially here in Goa, where I live. But which is uh, comparatively uh, less violent than other parts of India, I would say. And that, I think, is because people have other sort of expressions. They have a lot of uh, folk traditions, dancing and singing and all that. And it's still there somewhat. Other aspect is that we here we are still struggling to find the space for the individual we are in many ways we are very tribalistic in our social behavior and conditioning this also leads to violence because violence is primarily violence towards the self. One is violent to oneself and then one cannot help being violent to others. And it's the same for love. You have to love yourself before you can love the other, even like teachers, like Jesus, when he says, love your neighbor as yourself. The self-love part is neglected in our teachings, usually. That, And then people try to love others without any love for the self. And this leads to kind of various tragedies, but it all starts with violence of some form. 
And we start that with very young children already. We are one and two, three-year-old kids who have to wear a particular dress code and go to kindergarten in very suffocating attire. So we start violence, teach them violence, we are violent. And I have also wondered if, if it was because we were so violent that uh, there was felt need to talk about Ahimsa and that that we developed this this because of violence and how we have internalized it so much and now nowadays there is much more possibility to express that either through social media or public spaces or politics or whatever, but it's it's all full of full of hatred and violence, whether it's uh, physical or verbal or emotional, it's all violence and driving, driving on the roads. And so, I mean, of course, occasionally you read of road rage, you know, how somebody is dragging some bike for a kilometer under a car because of road rage. But even when it doesn't get to that extreme, just going out on the road is scary. It's, it's... Are you saying that the paraphernalia of modern life with its high speed and alienation from the land, are you identifying that as one of the root causes for greater frustration and therefore greater violence? I would relate them. I, I won't say that that's the sole reason. But yes, I think we are. The pace is frustrating to the ordinary person. And um, yeah, it's affecting everyone in different ways, but it is quite quite universal and you can only hide so much. You, know? you like you can say I won't read newspapers because they are full of violence, but you cannot avoid and and to not get affected to keep uh, positive or uh, optimistic. Or at the, least equanimous. Yes. It becomes very difficult and it takes a struggle and therefore need for real teachings based on wisdom. Yeah. And not so much this IT kind of uh, popular quick answers, clever answers, you no, know, but deeper inner opening up and yeah. this shrouds of darkness that hides the splendor of the light within. Yeah. That. I found it very moving that in your book, you close your translator's note with these words, in profound adoration of the highest in you, this book is offered to you, beloved reader. So what 
can you can you offer some clues to you know the everyone who is seeking that highest in themselves particularly to young people you know as we close uh, before we close uh, i would really value your advice to young people who a are seeking that highest in themselves and therefore also seeking to walk the path of non violence well mm, nadraj viru once uh, spoke about he used the example of a hall full of people or saying let us have silence here and uh, so everybody is shouting for silence all they are saying is let us have silence how would silence come silence would come if we were to stop shouting for silence we if we became silent so this highest in oneself is actually the core of all of us and that is what we would call god the in hindi the term that is used is sahaj swaroop yes yes you, right yes same okay one's own true form or yeah. what sahaja so, is what one is born with well, and then yeah after we are born like russo says man is born free but everywhere in chains as soon as a free being is born immediately society binds it with various chains starting with all these ceremonies and naming ceremony and then the thread ceremony the tying ceremony all bondages how they not the child up into also so, likes and dislikes i mean uh, there is yes. also there is also a kind of an inbuilt mechanism that splits constantly splits our consciousness between yes. desire and aversion yes and uh, that is what i thought perhaps uh, narayan guru means when he says tearing the darkness of maya that shrouds awareness yes are we yes. i think that maybe the essence of that is to be able to get beyond this desire and aversion Yes. And so in concluding would you say that empathy and compassion are one way in which we get beyond this desire and aversion? Yes. In yes. in 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 the universe of Narayan Guru and Natraj Guru? Yes. Yes. Yes because we do even specifically say that when you say about a thing like this is mine this is my book or my table or my chair or my house the the self is identifying with something which is totally separate away from the body yeah and yeah. if you meditate on this we do say all are self realized beings all have true self realization if we just understand this how we can 
transcend the body limits and possess something outside ourselves, even a non-living thing. Yes, indeed. So this, uh, and this empathy is, it's really our nature. We, it is our we, nature. Uh -huh. Yes. And also, this also could be why we are so violent, because it's our nature to share. And when we have only violence to share, we become violent, because it's still our nature to share. To share or to extend ourselves? Yes, to extend ourselves. Which and is so, what... yeah. So if it then when that self is steeped in violence, it extends yes. the violence, right? Yes. So, yeah. but what would you say to young people who are striving to extend themselves by being anchored in nonviolence? What are some of the one or two things that you know you could share with them that will help them on their journey? They have to find this source within themselves, not not from outside. Yeah, yeah. And um, also they have to very critically examine themselves and their knowledge or information and what is just noise and what is information, what is knowledge, and then finally something, wisdom, which could be called some kind of finalized knowledge. But again, this is since this is finalized knowledge about ourselves, that one has to find this within oneself. So it is not knowing something as a, as you know, some subject you study. And this is where we often go wrong, that we try to know this knowable or to be known self as an object. It is not an object, it is the subject. And only way of knowing it is by going inward. Yeah. Introspection or meditation, whatever you call it. But it is, uh, it's not outward facing, it's Inward it's place. an inward journey. Yes. 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 Okay. In closing, can I request you to please uh, share your translation of the poem on empathy, uh, the verses on empathy? Perhaps if you could read verse one to four, because I think there are nine verses in all. Ten, uh, ten verses. Ten verses. Ten. In all. Okay. Yes, it's a darshakam. It's called Anukampa darshakam. Anukampa is, um, I trans, I called it empathy. Uh, Nadraju Guru translates it as mercy. But I, I felt that uh, my book doesn't open. Yes, it does. Okay. I would start with the brief introduction to the please, poem. Yes? Please, please. Ten verses on empathy. Anukampa Dashakam. Here we have another set of ten verses centered on the central concept of empathy, kindliness, compassion, grace, almost the Guru identifies this universal value of kindliness as constituting the core of the various religious exp 
expressions and also makes references to the world teachers who embodied the supreme value. This golden thread of kindliness runs through diverse religions, uniting them. The original in Malayalam was written in 1920. May I cause no harm at all, even to an end. Such empathy, O oh, maker of kindliness, and ever bless me with such contemplation that never strays from your sacred form. By grace comes happiness. Sorrows all come from a heart without love. Darkness, removing love, becomes the core of sorrow and the seed to all. Grace, love, empathy, all these three are of the same content. This guiding star of life, he alone lives who loves. Repeat this fresh chant of syllables nine. Grace, if there is not, then just bone, skin, and tissue, a foul-smelling mass is one. Like water flowing in desert sands, or a flower without fruit or scent. Okay. That is... Thank you so much. Thank you yeah, for making the time good. and thank you for being part of Ahimsa Conversations. You're very welcome.